and welcome to the University of Chicago UN campus in Hong Kong. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose UN campus here in Hong Kong, and I'd like to welcome you all to the end of art. Today we have about three experts who have international expertise and also have uh, significant expertise in Hong Kong who can shed light on today's topic. Uh, to start the program, I wanted to uh, begin with a little bit of a dark tone um, with the current art industry situation, and then end up hopefully looking for, with our experts, uh, some of the silver linings and some of the light that we can all hope for uh, as we roll out of COVID-19. And hopefully that will uh, help us understand that um, there will be a new beginning for art. But let's start with the virus data. So an update this morning that I read, we've now exceeded over 9 million cases worldwide. Um, there have been over 500,000 deaths worldwide. But Hong Kong today ranks 119th with only 1,161 cases and then five deaths. So on the surface, Hong Kong appears to be one of the safest places on the planet. So the art industry really should be bouncing back uh, quickly. Uh, but with travel restrictions loosening, I've noticed that uh, there just, even this morning, been 30 cases of the virus announced, and we're watching that situation closely. According to uh, Peter Keller, who is the general director of the International Council of Museums, all but about 5 to 7 percent of the world's museums are currently closed because of the coronavirus pandemics, and 1 in 10 may not reopen. According to the network of the European Museum Organization survey of 650 museums uh, in Europe and around the globe, 80% of those museums have lost income from ticket sales, their shops, their cafes. 60% have increased their online presence, which we'll talk about more today. 70% of museums have, have not had to lay off staff yet, but they're contemplating it. And 15% of the countries surveyed say, there's no emergency funding scheme in place uh, or available. So with that as a backdrop, I'd like to start to introduce our panelists, beginning with Alice Mung on the far left of your screen. Alice is the uh, executive director of the Asian Society Hong Kong Center as of August 2012. Prior to uh, the Asian Society, Alice was the director of the Museum of Chinese in America, the MOCA, from 2009 to 2011. There, she oversaw the entire expansion project of the 30-year-old organization and transformed the museum from a New York Chinatown institution to becoming the leading national museum dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of heritage, culture, and a diverse experience of people of Chinese descent in the United States. Ellis also served as the executive director of the Committee of 100 in the United States, a Chinese-American nonprofit membership organization founded by architect I.M. Hay. Chellis, uh, and Chellis Joyo Ma. Alice began her career at the Ohio Department of Development and became Managing Director of the Ohio Office of East and Southeast Asia, based in Hong Kong. She's also worked for the Hong Kong Property Group from 1995 to 2002. Welcome to you, Alice. Next uh, to her, we have Daisy Yeo Wong. Daisy is Deputy Director of the Hong Kong Palace Museum here in Hong Kong and is responsible for the museum's exhibition, research, collection, publication, learning, and public engagement programs. She has served as a Robert N. Shapiro Curator of Chinese and East Asian Art at the Peabody Essex Museum, and was the Chinese art specialist at the Smithsonian Freer Sackler. Daisy has led a number of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean art exhibitions, collection-based installations, research, acquisition, and fundraising projects. She co-curated the groundbreaking exhibition, The Empress of China's Forbidden City, and co-edited the publication, which was merited with the Smithsonian's Secretary's Research Prize in 2019. This exhibition was named the best thematic historical show in 2018 by the Boston Globe and one of the top 20 United States art exhibitions in 2019 by Hyperallergic. A specialist in the history of collecting lacquer Qing court portraiture, and the history of photography in China, Daisy has published internationally. Her most recent book is the first monograph of the founder of the Freer Gallery of Art, Charles Lang Freer, and the formation of his Chinese art collection. Daisy is a recipient of the Getty Museum Leadership Fellowship 
Award at the Asia Society and a Smithsonian Postdoctoral Fellowship. Her work has been merited with National Endowment for the Humanities Grant, a Smithsonian Scholarly Studies Award, and a Smithsonian Valuing World Cultures Award. Daisy is also the founder of American Alliance of Museums, China program, largest annual U.S.-China Museum Professional Exchange Initiative. And welcome to Daisy. Thank you, Mark. Finally, we have Pauline J. Yao, who is a graduate of the University of Chicago and the lead curator and visual art at M+. Pauline has held curatorial positions at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco and worked as an independent curator and writer in Beijing for six years, during which time she helped co-found the storefront art space Carol Factory. Since joining M+, in 2012, Pauline has played a key role, a leading role, uh, in building the visual art collection by overseeing and acquiring works from around Asia and beyond. Pauline is co-curator of the 2009 Shenzhen and Hong Kong Bi-City Biennial of Urban, Urbanism and Architecture. She's a regular contributor to Art Forum International and is the co-editor of Podium M Plus online publication. Pauline's writings on contemporary Asian art have appeared in numerous catalogs, online publications, and edited volumes. Recently, Pauline curated five artists, Sites Encounter, an exhibition held last year at the M Plus Pavilion. And we want to welcome you back, Pauline. Thank you for joining us today. So um, to get started with a little bit of the backdrop and the introductions of our panelists, I, I'm interested in hearing from each of you, starting with Dallas, uh, about you know, sort of your experience and your institution's experience during the COVID crisis. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, this afternoon to uh, to talk about the subject uh, end of art. It was a very provocative title and and just a, a little bit uh, about Asia Society here uh, in Hong Kong, Asia Society Hong Kong Center. We were founded um, exactly 30 years ago um, and Asia Society is affiliated with the Asia Society Museum um, and Asia Society uh, founded by John D. Rockefeller III in New York um, in 1956. So we are um, the first center of Asia Society to be in Asia. And currently it's an um, organization that has uh, 13 uh, global centers, seven here in Asia, five in the US, and one in Europe, in Zurich. And so we're delighted that you know here about uh, eight years ago when I came back to Hong Kong, became the executive director in August of uh, 2012, um, the center actually opened, uh, the Hong Kong Center in, in February of 2012. So for the past eight years, we've been able to mount exhibitions, uh, do programming, and, uh, and it's been really a delight to, um, to be the executive, the inaugural executive director of uh, the center that um, uh, has a, a beautiful gallery, a Chantal Miller Gallery, and a beautiful theater, uh, the Miller Theater, 100 seat. And then, so we've been able to do programming and exhibition for the last, um, very much part of the community for the last eight years. And then, uh, so we're really, um, uh, unlike other organizations, um, I think we're private, we're privately funded. It's a, we're a Hong Kong entity, uh, very much, uh, but with an affiliation with a global institute. And so that's really the kind of the brief history of Asia Society Hong Kong. Thank you. And uh, Daisy. Hi, good afternoon. This is Daisy Wang, uh, representing the Hong Kong Palace Museum. Uh, we are a newly born baby in Hong Kong. Uh, we are scheduled to open to the public uh, in June 2022. So we're doing the countdown right now. Two years from now, we're open. And this is both a uh, local and global institution as we envisioned. Um, at its core, this is a culture and educational resource for people in Hong Kong. But also we are very global is that uh, we want to advance the understanding of Chinese art and culture through global partnership. Um, so we're not just limited to the study and display uh, of Chinese art. Uh, we want to promote a dialogue between Chinese art and culture and world civilizations. Um, the museum um, is a collaborative project between the West Kowloon Culture District Authority in Hong Kong and the Palace Museum, often known as the Forbidden City, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and also, I'm so delighted to be here because um, the capital cost of this museum is uh, fully funded uh, by generous donation from the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charities Trust, uh, which also support the campus here. 
So that's our connection. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, good afternoon. So um, I am, uh, as Mark introduced, uh, here to uh, represent M+. Uh, for those of you who don't know, M+, is a new museum of visual culture being built in Hong Kong. So we, um, like Daisy, are not, not yet open. We are, we are, maybe your babies were toddlers. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. We're getting close to adults. We will open next year. Um, the M+, Museum of Visual Culture has been uh, in process since uh, 2011 uh, or so. Um, our site is um, also on the West Kowloon uh, reclaimed uh, piece of land in West Kowloon and part of the West Kowloon Cultural District, uh, which will be, you know, it's a shared piece of land that the Palace Museum is, is also sharing uh, with us. And our building is in construction. We've been doing programs um, around town in Hong Kong, operating really as a museum, but not with our building complete. So we've been doing exhibitions. We've been building our collection um, for the last uh, seven, eight uh, years. And uh, we've been, in the last couple of years, using one particular space um, on the West Kowloon site, which is uh, the M Plus Pavilion. So we've been doing exhibitions um, there, and I can talk more about that. Um, and in terms of our collection and what we do as an institution, uh, we're a museum of visual culture, which encompasses visual art, architecture and design, um, moving image. And uh, we have several different disciplinary areas and curatorial teams uh, that work on programs um, and exhibitions um, and uh, a variety of different online uh, offerings as well, which I think we'll also get into and, and speak about. But the collection is now uh, around 6,000 works or so and um, over, I don't want to say, I think over 30,000 archive um, records. So it encompasses archive as well as uh, objects um, and across all these different uh, uh, disciplines and it is still uh, continuing to grow and we are um, a fully public institution completely publicly uh, funded um, by um, the West Calhoun Cultural District uh, Authority and so public sort of ethos runs uh, strong through everything that we do and I think that will come into play in our future the rest of our conversation today. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you Paul. I mean, that's, that's a great introduction and uh, so for the audience that's not aware, the art industry globally is about $67.5 billion. And so, you know, one of the things that I thought a lot about before COVID, and I've actually talked with the chairman of our visual arts department at the University of Chicago is, was there too much art, you know, before COVID? And so I'd like, I'd like to hear each of your thoughts about that. You know, you can talk about it from the standpoint of, you know, museum exhibitions, too many artworks, too many artists, however you want to come at it and uh, just share your opinion. Well, thank you. That's a really interesting question, um, which I, I would have to say, as somebody who uh, loved museum and who loved art, there can never be enough art. I mean, would you ask a question of, is there enough writers? Um, I think art is just part of our, you know, of human. I mean, we've been creating art since there, you know, uh, in, in the beginning of time. So I think art, uh, so it depends on how, what you mean by too many art. Um, but I, I would agree, disagree that there is too many. And I think different countries of the world are also, um, you know, you know, maybe there's too many museums, some would argue, uh, but again, as a museum goer, I think there could be, you know, there's never enough, but it's how we access it. Um, I think museum to me, um, sometimes it's like this temple of art and or, or, uh, or galleries, sometimes intimidating. Um, but I think in terms of just general art, you know, for art's sake, for people, look at young people, uh, kids. Uh, I, I have a, a young niece who, who's drawing me, creating art for me all the time. And I, those art keep on coming. So I would argue that there, you, you really need art. Um, uh, there's not enough of it, but I think it's the way we organize it and the way we appreciate it uh, and the way we collect it. Um, uh, I'm not a collector. Asia Society, um, Hong Kong Center, we, unlike um, the other two institutions, so all of you, we're not a collecting uh, institution, but we showcase. And so for me, um, it's the more art, the better. And it, art from whether it's traditional uh, to contemporary to Eastern, Western, I just feel like um, each culture, that, that's art is a way of their expressing who they are, um, is their language. So I, I would want to see the more, the merrier. Great. Daisy, I'll just add, you know, another bit to that question, which is, um, did, has the advent of the internet created too much access to art? And um, kind of following on to Alice's point, um, 
is do we need it more than ever before because of the COVID crisis and the fact that many of us are working, still working from home, uh, not out in public, uh, in other parts of the world? Just to add a couple layers to that question. Sure. Um, I think that I would want to change the question a little bit, really to think about, you know, in this changing time, how can we make art more relevant to people's life today? Um, because I guess, you know, the question you raised is really probably about the criticism about, you know, what now you have people unemployed, people have no money, you know, people losing their homes and jobs. You know, is art that important, right? I think. Of course, if you ask all of us, because we're in the industry here, well, of course, we will say art is very important to us um, as a professional, as a person. The, the broader question is that how do we all work together to make uh, art more relevant to us today? And how can we make art museum and other cultural institutions more meaningful and more productive forces in society? So in going back to your um, question, you know, right now, um, people, staying at home. Um, I think that there is there's a lot of psychological issues um, related to people who are confined to a very limited space, unless you've know, got a pool, you've got acres of land. I think that more than ever, people are looking for human connections, for art and spiritual experiences. And I think that for us, you know, we, we need to consider if this crisis continues or become the norm, how do we change and how do we connect with people who are staying at home or spend a lot of time online? Great, thank you. Pauline, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I'm, I agree with both of you. You both raised really interesting um, points. I mean, I think um, in some sense, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far to say there was too much. I think um, I agree with Alice. There, there's, you know, kind of never enough, and there's, there's, you know, um, not something I would ever want to put a cap on. Um, uh, but at the same time, I do think that the sort of pre-COVID moment, um, you know, we can notice now, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, seeing how um, things now look like it was a little bit almost out of control then like some sense of just there was there was so many activities so many exhibitions so many events um for those of us who are you know active in the international art world going to exhibitions and events biennials I mean, you're traveling constantly and one cannot possibly go to all of these things there are so many things happening that it's 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 about what you can take in what you can absorb and like access to it making it yeah, having a response to it, having enough of time with it to have a meaningful engagement with that work, um, which I think sometimes gets can get a little bit lost in that shuffle of, of there being so much to see and the rush to see it all and absorb all of it and take it all in. And, you know, that's part of the, um, the, the economy and the market that um, exists as well, which has also been uh, growing and um, that's part of it as well as you know the museums and these things are intertwined um, I find more and and more um, so you know again it's not it's not a criticism to say that something was wrong but I think it's a good um, uh, now a moment to sort of rethink and recalibrate um, a little bit how how things look going into the future um, it isn't just about quantity you know it's, it's also about quality and a quality of that actual engagement or experience that you have with a given artwork um, to, to sort of like follow on to that, doesn't that make uh, the curator's role even more important? The, the, in terms of the quality experience and the engagement, yes, <laughs> that's, um, that's the task we, we have uh, we, that we face, especially um, in museums and especially in public institutions where uh, that's who we serve. We serve uh, the public, we serve our, our, our audience, we want to make that uh, experience of them coming into the uh, museum and encountering a work and and that whole um, yeah interaction um, is something that uh, is yeah very much in our sort of domain and purview but that's all also changed from what it was you know now we may have um, different circumstances of people visiting you may I mean it in some ways can be you know a benefit of having perhaps less people around um, in, in exhibitions which I mean 
people tell stories all the time about going to see exhibitions and you're waiting in line to read the label. You know, there's three or four people deep, you know, it's so crowded and packed and maybe those kinds of circumstances will be different that you can have fewer people around um, and, and maybe slow down a little and take time to, to look um, a little bit. And yeah, our curator, uh, our job is to sort of, yeah, think of that experience and try to make that um, a meaningful, meaningful wall and build those bridges, like you're saying, making it relevant, you know, to people and like having a way for them to access what they're seeing if they're not, uh, you know, a specialist or know exactly already uh, all about the artist's background or what their, their practice is. So we have to kind of find a way to convey that information and in a way that'll be compelling. So, so I'm, I'm already off my own script because the, because the conversation is very fascinating to me. Um, and you know, each of you touched on this point and it's something I think about a lot, which is how, how do you get more people interested in art? And are people in Hong Kong sufficiently interested in art? Should they be more interested in art? You know, is the audience there in the way that you think it should be? I'll, I'll start with that, Alice. Well, I think um, the audience is definitely there. Um, I think uh, we can see it from our own exhibitions that I've, we've put together. We've put together over 20 some exhibitions, whether it's the work of um, uh, the Japanese artist Nara, or we, we brought in uh, Caravaggio, the first ever uh, from uh, the Berea to Hong Kong a few years ago, or just local Hong Kong artists, which we've done two shows. I think the audience is curious. It's always been there. And I think unlike um, institutions in the, um, in US and Europe where they have always had um, big museum. I mean, this year, I think the Met is celebrating 150th anniversary. Um, and, you know, museums in the US, I, you know, you've been involved with, uh, and as well as uh, many museums in the United States and Asia Society in New York has been there for over 60 some years. So, but here in Hong Kong, here in Asia, I think museums um, uh, have not been here that long. And even the Palace Museum originally from uh, uh, China has only been, what, over, a little bit over 100 years old, or around 100. Not, so, so, it's, so what I find interesting is here the audience uh, for art, um, I think audience is always curious. I think Hong Kong is also, we see it this last couple of years, especially during uh, the crazy month of March, and this is where I definitely agree with Pauline. I think it just the, 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 the runaround, it's so crazy that month, of, that month of March with the two art fairs, um, with all the gallery opening, the, the global audience coming here. I think sometimes we lose sight of art for art's sake and for the people, um, you know, not just collectors, but just general public. And I think for me, um, the audience here in Hong Kong, uh, from my experience has been, just growing and curious. And so um, I think the art fair always sells out in terms of their ticket, the general public tickets. Um, I'm really excited now that with the, the West Kowloon, but even in November, um, the, uh, the museum, Hong Kong Museum of Art reopened after renovation and the audience has been there, although the audience lately because of social distancing rules um, uh, have been smaller. So I think audience has always been there, but it's just that you have to present it. I think good curatorialship, relevancy, accessibility is something that I feel is more important than ever because it, you can't talk over them. I think the art has to be, um, um, you have to appreciate them. And I, for me right now, what I'm very interested in is also the different demographics um, because I am an older demographic. I've been going to museums since I was a kid and I grew up loving museums. For me, museum is a, a place where I learn. I'm not a collector um, because I don't have the financial means, but for me, a museum or any public uh, uh, buildings with, you know, galleries, museums and so on, is where somebody like me can go and see the best art. When I travel, um, it's always the museums first. Um, so I think that's really, the, the audience is, and we know from uh, the numbers, uh, I think the Met has said you know, their number one audience, global audience has been those coming from uh, this part of the world, I think China. So, so, so I think if they're traveling to US to go to a museum, they're also interested in art here in their home backyard. Um, and I think this is, that's why it's so exciting. I'm so looking forward to Palace. I'm so looking forward to M Plus when they finally open. But in the meantime, we have been open and we have seen the audience uh, grown and also younger audience. In fact, before I left the office, we saw a group of uh, young people at kindergarten um, coming in. And so I think that to me is really the exciting 
thing is that the audience is there, and, but it's up to the institution to access them. Great. Thanks, Alice. Daisy, um, to add to that question um, and to Alice's point, do you think with your background in U.S. institutions, is there enough uh, age distribution, income distribution, education distribution in the museum going audience? I'm relatively new in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm a transplant from the U.S. museum world to uh, museum work here uh, about a year ago. Um, my previous museum um, is a uh, major museum in the Boston area, uh, quite affluent, uh, and the, um, the average age group is about 55 and up. So it is an aging population in terms of core audience uh, for that museum. Uh, I think here what is really exciting is that I see a lot of potential areas of growth in terms of um, outreach, in terms of um, audience uh, cultivation. Uh, one of the stats I found recently is that um, we assume there were a lot of mainland Chinese tourists visiting Hong Kong and they might be interested in museums and uh, art and cultural activities. But in fact, the majority of them are shoppers. <laughs> so the question I, I gave to myself is, how do you capture that huge part of the population, you know, flooding into Hong Kong, um, looking for things, fun things to do and meaningful and relevant things to do. Um, so in fact, right now, uh, according to some of the um, stats from the tourism industries that only 3% of this, you know, huge, huge shop, group of shoppers from mainland China um, were visiting museums in Hong Kong. Um, so I think that that is something, you know, we need to think very hard is that how do we make the museum relevant, exciting? Um, to them. Uh, the other thing is I, I totally agree with Alice is that um, con in contrast to the kind of aging core audience here, there's a lot of curiosity in young people. I think that I, I definitely, you know, expect a much younger audience for my museum and family audience as well. Uh, but also you see a lot of diversity. Um, you see also here, um, the life span is very high here, very long here. So that's something in Hong Kong should be very proud of. You see also a large group of seniors really interested in, you know, lifelong learning, interesting volunteering, interesting museum and culture and enrichment activities. Um, so I think that, yes, this is a world that is uh, new or new, relatively new to museums, but also you see that uh, Hong Kong government invested very heavily in cultural industries and in museums as well. There is a conglomeration of a museum under uh, what we call LCSD, which is a department under the Hong Kong government. Uh, these are very established museums, well-visited museums like the Hong Kong Heritage Museum, History Museum, and newly reopened museum called Hong Kong Museum of Art. So I think building on their success, you know, we, we want to also um, help to, you know, uh, add our contribution to the field uh, in the museum growth in this part of the world. Great. So um, Pauline M plus is getting closer, right, to opening. So you've probably thought about a lot of these things and how do you draw in this broad, diverse uh, community. Um, one thing that's always on my mind is, you know, are young people interested just because they, they see numbers, they see, they see auction records. This is, you know, something that they see that's stimulating them. Or are they really interested in the art? Just what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so... Um just uh, to say a bit about our, our opening and our timeline, we are soon, uh, hopefully by the end of um, the summer and into autumn, we'll move our offices into our new building. So our building is really very, very close to completion. Um, and we'll start moving in and then we will aim to have um, our grand opening around this time next year. So it's about a year uh, away. Um, and then we've been, as I mentioned, using uh, the pavilion in West Kowloon to do exhibitions. So we, we have, you know, as a museum that's not open yet, it's, it's still a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainties. And then now everything has shifted because of COVID uh, projections and all this kind of thing as well. So, I mean, we're trying to gather numbers and market research and so on, which we have been able to do through the pavilion audience, but it's, you know, and it is again just what you're saying. You know, it's, it's a very different demographic than we're, what we're used to in America and the States, which tends to be, you know, a sort of 55 and, and up or seniors or something like that. Here, definitely much more younger um, demographic. And, and as you say, I, I mean, I think there probably are some people, uh, particularly in Hong Kong, with, with the popularity of, of our Basel and uh, with the auctions here, 
Hong Kong is known as a place for buying and selling art of all kinds, not just contemporary, obviously antiquities, everything. This is part of the history of Hong Kong. Um, and it's, you know, a place that people visit to collectors, you know, dealers, everything. This is a very, very long history. So I think that is something that people in Hong Kong already know and aware about and, and maybe somewhere transfer that idea into going to see art would be somehow related to want maybe their interest may be piqued by its performance within the market <laughs> may translate to what they may want to see um and so i think it does take uh some time and effort for us to maybe shift that a little bit so shift that understanding that not you know not not the best art and not all good art has you know um performed at auction in this way and you're not going to maybe read about it in those those kind of uh, news articles and and so on, but that doesn't make it, you know, um, uh, not worthwhile to to see and engage with. And there's a whole other kind of whole other other types of practices which maybe are not at all encompassed within um, the art market. Um, a lot of, you know, site specific work, installation, performance, all kinds of things that are uh, of a very different nature. Um, and so I think people, I think generally people come because they're curious. You know, they're 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 are um, young people who grow up in Hong Kong who want to have cultural experiences, who want to add that to their activities that they do on the weekend or in their spare time. And um, going to see you know, art and take in art and culture is, is more and more part of that than it's just about sort of while, they're, while you um, have their interest there to you know, take advantage of and, and open up some new ideas and new ways of thinking about what that is and maybe just changing some of those possible preconceptions that, that could exist. Great. Um, thanks for helping uh, change or alter my cynical view of the art industry as a whole. I, I appreciate that. But I, I, that's the answer that I hope for. Um, you know, uh, when people ask me, you know, how should I get started in art? I, I always tell them, just start with one piece that you really love. In 10 years, you may hate it, but just get it because you love it now. And you cultivate your interest, you cultivate your taste by starting some way and starting small. Um, and so, you know, with that, I wanted to shift gears. Uh, I talked to a f an artist friend of mine from Chile on Sunday night. Um, Chile is really rising to the top of the list of countries that are facing COVID. And so I was curious, they're all in lockdown. I was curious with him, you know, how are things going? And um, he, uh, one of the things about Chile that you should know is that they're, they have a, um, it's almost like a family institutionalized um, collecting uh, culture, right? And so when you get married, you get a piece of art. You know, when you have a baby, the family gives a piece of art. And so that it becomes part of the culture um, in a place like Chile. So I, I asked him how he was doing and he said, um, he was actually, he showed me uh, the studio that he was building in his home because he couldn't get down to his own studio. And he said, um, I asked him, well, how's, how are things going? You know, are collectors, you know, buying your works? And he said more than ever before, which really surprised me. And I said, well, why? And you know, this particular artist in his Chilean way, uh, you know, said, I think they're bored. And uh, I said, well, it's probably more than that they're just bored. But um, we continued that conversation and he basically said that they were, uh, collect his collectors were more introspective. Um, and so they were using art as a way to sort of deal with the times. So um, what I am curious about, if you've had any interactions with artists locally or internationally recently, how are they dealing with the COVID crisis and what do they see as the future? Well, for, uh, for us here in Hong Kong, um, we never had the lockdown um, like the rest of the world. I think maybe for a month in April, uh, Asian Society, we were closed. We had a show that we was due to open called Next Act, uh, contemporary, uh, focusing on contemporary Hong Kong art. Um, so what we uh, were really nervous because uh, about that, because three of the artists uh, were not here. They, one was in Berlin and one in New York and one in Guangzhou. And some of the work also had to be manufactured in uh, southern China. So in the end, um, the show opened, and and you know it's getting great uh, reviews. Uh, we're getting good audience. And in fact, you know because of social distancing rules, it's not full capacity. So I think the artists are some of them are dealing in this part of the world where um, it's dealing it I think quite well in some ways. Uh, and like you said, you know people are buying art. In fact, right now I think Art Basel online. Um, this is the second iteration during March. They had the uh, Art Basel Hong Kong online, and then technology has gotten better. So online viewing, 
Um, and so people, I think, agree with what your friend said about in, uh, introspection. And I find the artists themselves are also um, using this opportunity. I think it's sometimes when it's crisis, you, you create art. It sometimes could be great art or, or whatever. It's a way of dealing artists himself and, and collector in the audience. So I find that it's a good time for artists. I think it's because also time. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's uh, here, especially in Hong Kong, um, time is such a, uh, you know, we're always so busy. I think Hong Kong is probably one of the most busiest cities. I lived in New York for nine years. And I think New York is nothing like Hong Kong. Hong Kong is just like, we're constantly, time is money, you know, this, this city. But now with the slowdown, you know, fortunately for us, not a lockdown, we've had time to think about it. Do we really need to travel to go see great art? We have art locally. So I think this introspection of looking inward and I think local Hong Kong artists, and, and also another great thing about Hong Kong is this last um, decade, there's been a growth of galleries, of international galleries. I think I understand the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association um, is over, uh, over 50 members. I mean, they're not just from um, uh, Hong Kong and they don't just carry Hong Kong artists. Uh, they represent uh, global artists. And I think they're taking advantage of, of that time of slowing down to, to really, in fact, this last weekend, there was a wonderful pop-up or, or smaller art fair uh, focusing on a Hong Kong gallery at Daigun, which is another institution like us, just opened uh, maybe two years ago. And so I think it is a good time to reflect. And I think artists are using that time uh, as well as collectors. So, um, so I look forward um, to, in fact, next year for, uh, we are also probably gonna continue the theme of looking at Hong Kong artists uh, because we're celebrating our 30th anniversary. And in 2022, we will be celebrating 10 years of, in our historical site also, uh, thanks to Jockey Club uh, support. And so we're using this two or three years time to really looking at uh, not just Hong Kong artists, but Asian artists in a way that uh, maybe has not been covered uh, as much uh, in the West. And this is a really good time to showcase uh, some of the, the rising emerging, emerging um, Hong Kong and Asian artists, um, which is, is a good time to do that. Great. Um, you know, I always, when I talk to artists, I always um, liken the work that they do to a startup entrepreneur. You know, they start with a blank slate, a blank canvas, you know, and your point I think is really valid. It sounds like the whole industry is slowing down and taking time to think, but you know, some of the artists that I think do the best work are the most reclusive, right? They're not out there, you know, sort of pitching, selling, you know, listening to ideas in the market. They're actually just thinking about what they want to create. And so kind of off the back of that, comment and what Alice said, Daisy or Pauline, do you have any comments that you'd specifically like to make? I was just um, thinking how I agree with Alice, uh, what, she's, what she's outlined, but it, it's also just thinking how it's so different for each different artist, because you, you have cases where artists, um, you know, because of a very uh, powerful art market um, and artists who have, a, have studios that employ many people to help them produce their work, um, fabrication, whatever it may be. And then, so they're like these mini businesses that then have had to let people go. And then their whole operation is just like gone to a standstill, which is totally different than what they're used to. Um, and then, on the, then you also have other artists who, you know, always work at home in front of a computer. That's their, their conceptual artists. They don't ever have a studio. They never really employ anyone. They're, they're just a one man operation or one person operation. For them, this, this is kind of a normal way of operating anyway, you know? So I think it's just so interesting how, when you start to peel back and look at how people, how artists work, uh, the conditions that they work in, where they work, um, you know, obviously in New York, a lot of discussion around artist studios and the cost of the studios and rent and, and all the economic impacts of, of that, let alone not having people to, to help you produce what you might need to produce um, and or collectors backing out of sales. And, you know, it's so complex and it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's um, the whole industry, you know, it's just, it's not, it's the artists, but it's all the people that depend upon that industry for their own livelihood as, as well. And it's so uh, different com compared to different locations. Um, in Hong Kong, we have, you know, uh, always, uh, artists who historically don't have huge artists, if they or have studios, if they even can have them at all, you know? So not to say they're not impacted, but it would be very different than how it would be impact, impacting artists in, in just, you know, uh, across the border in China, which um, I know artists there who are frequently working in very large spaces and, and, um, and uh, you know, they have a kind of different operation 
um, going on. So I, it's just like the diversity of the art world is so big. Yeah. Daisy, I'll let you have the last word on artists if you'd like to add anything. Sure. I think that let's not forget that artists are creative agents, but also they're real people just like us. Uh, in this very challenging time, you know, we all need resources, we need jobs. Um, so it's very important that um, we in the art industry also uh, make an effort to support artist initiatives. Um, I was very impressed by the vibrancy and the strength of the artist communities in Hong Kong because um, two weeks ago I attended an opening. Um, you, you didn't feel you know, there's COVID-19. Of course, you know, we're do, still doing social distancing and check your temperature. But I, I was, I think that was a very heartwarming and uh, very encouraging uh, experience for me. Uh, but also I just want to mention very briefly is that um, West Collin Culture District is uh, administering a uh, art relief project really to uh, provide funding to support uh, innovative, relevant uh, art, artist projects, artist initiative projects. Um, so I'm actually um, reviewing some of the proposals and it just looks such exciting opportunities um, to brighten everybody's spirit. <laughs> Um, but also, um, in terms of the what the Hong Kong Palace Museum will do, yes, you know, we are a museum devoted to uh, mainly to the study of um, historic art and culture in Chinese history, but also uh, we are very committed to promoting dialogue between living artists uh, locally and internationally with tradition. Um, so we are cooking up a very exciting project um, to um, really select uh, in the first round, uh, local artists to have dialogue with traditional artists. So we're very excited about that too. Oh, that's great. And that's also a great segue to one of the areas that I wanted to get into. And Pauline, you know well that, you know, at University of Chicago, we like our data. So I wanted to just share a little bit of data on um, uh, government support, actually, historically. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but the U.S. Federal Art Project um, was instituted between 1935 and 1947 and $27 million back then, about $410 million in today's uh, money, um, supported 10,000 artists, uh, 100 um, established community art centers. It created more than 200,000 new works. It actually contributed to the establishment of art uh, abstract expressionism and um, led to people like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko uh, really uh, emerging from that period. Um, today, the Trump administration has um, included only $200 million uh, out of a $2 trillion stimulus package to support the arts. That's the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities. And um, by comparison, Germany has um, allocated $50 billion for um, businesses related to the arts and artists and creatives and media. Um, and the UK, $160 million for um, for the arts organizations, $20 million for individual and freelance artists, obviously in markets much smaller than the United States. So the US isn't leading in this area. Um, it sounds like you know, there's already an initiative here in Hong Kong. I guess the question I have is, um, are governments lagging behind in supporting the arts? What more can they do? And is Hong Kong doing enough? Well, for, as an institution here in Hong Kong um, that have benefited from the Hong Kong government support, I have to say the efficiency uh, within weeks, uh, we've gotten grants. In fact, it's in the bank almost right, you know, within two months. So we receive government grants. Uh, we also uh, are eligible to apply for um, of the payroll scheme, which also uh, the money has come. So I, I would uh, applaud the Hong Kong government. Um, I don't know about uh, the rest of Asia, but I know from our personal experience here in Hong Kong, um, as an art and cultural institution, we have benefited from the Hong Kong support. And my understanding, kind of what Daisy has said about uh, the initiative, um, there are other uh, arts development council, I think Jockey Club Charitable Trust, many of the foundations we're talking to are really um, there. They, they are um, uh, to support the art industry, the art. I think Hong Kong's art ecosystem is actually relatively young, uh, as I said before, compared to the rest, um, the rest of the world, especially United States. It's really sad. Uh, but even before COVID, I think there were talk about disbanding the National Endowment for Humanities and so on and so forth, which is, I think, in a, a country, a, a society uh, needs art. I always feel like art is a soul of a, of a, of a nation, uh, of a culture. And I think the Palace Museum is a really good example, um, whether it's in the one in Taipei or the one in uh, or Beijing. Um, museums, I mean, that is who you, that's part of your identity. 
um, uh, your cultural identity. So I, it's really sad. I think all the numbers you said about the United States, unfortunately, is true. And also um, in the U.S., many of the uh, uh, museums, especially even the big ones. I mean, I hear the Met is, uh, you know, they're not opening until probably September, October. Major budget deficits and and their their endowment. They're they're probably one of the biggest uh, art institution uh, in the United States, and they're going to be. Um, uh, suffering along with the other ones. And also remember they're coming out of the 2008 financial crisis. I think it took them almost 10 years to adjust. And now without the government support, um, I understand government has to balance, you know, uh, 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 support, but when it comes to the art and you, you know, some of the numbers, you, as the stuff you mentioned uh, in the thirties and forties, many of these artists really also contributed to the recovery uh, the Great Depressions. I mean, I know, you know, the, the, many of the initiative. Um, I love Perel, uh, Rivera's work because of the work that he did um, he, during that period. So I think um, it's really important that I think government do figure out a way, uh, whether it's, you know, working in conjunction with, with donors to support um, the, the art industry and art ecosystem, mm -hmm. because art does create jobs. And it's also, um, it, it's vital to a civilization. And I think it would be so sad if we do not have uh, of government funding. Um, but I think each government has their own rationale. And sometimes some government, like people, don't act rationally, uh, which is something I hope might change in the future. Daisy, other than West Kowloon, do you have any other anecdotes or? Um, I also want to share a little bit about um, the differences between um, the US museum world and museum world here in Hong Kong. Uh, for those of you who are not super familiar with the um, museum world in the United States, is that even for institutions like the Smithsonian, it basically is a national museum, so, um, and they do not receive 100% uh, funding from the government. And for many museums, yes, the operating cost is covered by the government, but you still have to raise sometimes all the money for programs. Let's say, you know, the exhibition that I did, and we have to raise millions of dollars, so there's no show. Um, so I think that I see a trend in Hong Kong to diversify the funding sources uh, uh, for museums and the cultural institution. I think it's a healthy trend. Uh, for example, yes, you know, um, we are supported by the Hong Kong Jockey Club uh, Charities Trust, but also, you know, that's, that's mainly the capital cost for the museum. But after we open, we have to be very entrepreneurial. We cannot just, you know, say, okay, we're begging the government for money. We have to make our museum a self-sustaining museum. So I think that it's, it's a challenging time, but it really, you know, it's an interesting time for, for more museums to become more uh, entrepreneurial. Um, and yes, in Hong Kong, um, the LCSD museums, these are government museums, uh, and the government have poured in support for these kind of museums, such as the uh, renovation project for the Hong Kong Museum of Art. But I think it, it's a healthy way for us to think more about how museums can contribute to the society here and to be, uh, you know, strategically uh, how to be self-sustaining. I, I think I, I really do agree with say, what Daisy said too, but I think in this time, COVID is an unusual situation. And so I think you almost have to save, like I remember a couple of years ago, um, you know, they saved the card industry in, in Detroit, right? You know, when, when you're in that crisis mode, I think some of the government does have to step in. It doesn't mean they have to um, uh, support it. I, and one of the funds that I, we're going to be applying for, which I'm, and going back to what you said about entrepreneurial, um, you know, the, our, all the institutions have to be, is that we have been thinking about moving our, our store online for a long time. And right now I understand there is an innovation fund from the Hong Kong government that organization like us can apply to go uh, move our store online. So things like that, sometimes it's not direct money, but it's like grants and support that, that will help uh, save an industry. So I, if you can save a car industry, like, like in Detroit, I certainly think um, industry, arts and cultural industry um, is also in need of, of saving and preserving for the future generation. If you let it go now, in fact, I think the numbers that you cited earlier, um, I think some of the big players will survive, maybe, you know, smaller scale, but I worry the smaller institutions uh, that does not traditionally get that. And also, you know, a lot of it's fundraiser, uh, their, their own fundraising. If they don't survive, then it's really a sad day. It's, it's the smaller institutions that, that would be, you know, really impacted greatly by this extraordinary circumstance of COVID. 
just to add to what Alice has said, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I think government should definitely, you know, increase its support for arts and culture here. Uh, but also, I think that you know, it has to be everybody, it has to be individuals, it has to be corporations, it has to be foundations that together, you know, how do we support and how do we basic save some of the wonderful, important uh, institutions and artists here? Does that culture exist today? of everybody working together to support the institutions? Maybe I'll ask Pauline. In Hong Kong? Yes. Institutions working together for? To support the arts institutions as they, yeah. I see them do so much in the States. Yeah, I think so. And I think more and more, I mean, I think, you know, kind of, um, yeah, that exists. And, and even maybe the situation that we're in with COVID is maybe even fostering more of that sort of attitude and thinking that, um, you know, while I agree with, uh, you know, the government's support, at the same time, I think people also say we can't sit and wait for the handout. We have to actually take action and do things on our own, right? And that is um, something that I have noticed, you know, whether it's in Hong Kong or just with, the, for me, I've noticed it more within the region because I, um, you know, we do, I do a lot of work with other, you know, um, organizations, institutions around, around the rest of Asia. And it's just, yeah, you sort of see how, um, in these sort of circumstances, there are uh, so many institutions facing so many hurdles, so many uncertainties, and it is a little bit of the spirit and feeling of like, let's band together. If we can kind of shoulder some of this weight together, it will be a little bit less risky, less scary, you know, so on and so forth, and share the sort of load of whatever risk there may be. And um, there is, a, I do feel a kind of sense of our uh, collaboration and, and more conversations happening across institutions than, than there were before, because everyone's sort of now comparing notes, getting right. to know how everyone else is doing things and seeing where there are, are opportunities to work together. Well, an example here in Hong Kong would be um, this uh, uh, Art Power uh, Hong Kong, which is a, a, a platform. And I think it started off, I think uh, I'm on the working group and along with some of the um, galleries as well as um, auction houses representative. So, our Power Hong Kong right now has 139 partners, and that all happened because of, of that urgency once they heard the art fair was canceled, and there were so much initiative. So that came together organically, and the crowdfunding has helped support that. And, and in fact, it's gone from strength to strength. I think they just announced, uh, we've announced extending it till next June. Um, used to, you know, used to be we were event driven or art fair driven, but now this this organization, this collaboration, just came together. Um, it, I'm so proud. And also Hong Kong. That's another beauty of Hong Kong. It's how fast and how um, collaborative. I mean, because the other institutions, because everybody has their own uh, way of doing things, own network, and, and, and especially in New York, you have big institutions, small institution, medium. Here, we're all kind of in this beginning stages, um, and some of you, have not, you know, but we all, there's that collaboration that I saw ha happen here really fast that I'm particularly proud to be, be part of. Great. We, we don't have a lot of time left, but you're moving into some of my territory here. Um, I wanted to just share a little bit more information from that NEMOS survey of the 650 museums. Um, they said that 60% of the museums increased their online presence. And the, the Met had a over 4,000% growth in their streaming viewership from their Met 360 uh, project. And Art Basel's online viewing room had a virtual fair featuring 234 galleries and 2,100 artworks. So we had a lot of questions that were related to virtual and adaptation of institutions to the virtual world. I guess my question is, you know, not only what are you doing, what are you seeing, and then will art enthusiasts accept and adapt to the new technology, the virtual experiences, will the museum audiences accept this, and will collectors eventually buy virtually? So um, I'll start They already with are. But they're, they're buying on the lower end of the spectrum from what I understand from the data. Oh, I, I'm not reading the data. <laughs> Just getting information out there from different um, sources. But um, I know I think people, I, I actually have an understanding which is a little bit different, which is that, the, that there are collectors who are purchasing and buying things online. Um, and it actually may tend to skew towards um, the higher end being that, uh, well, one, these are individuals who whose wealth is, you know, um, secure or safe, that they, they can do that. Um, and then also they're familiar with the artist, they're familiar with the work, mm -hmm. and they may be able to be more willing to take a risk of buying something that they can't physically see. 
because they know the artist practice as a whole. Um, and so they may acquire a work which is uh, someone that they're familiar with and they've seen other works and they can make a reasonable judgment of that being uh, okay, even though they haven't set eyes on that actual work. Um, and But at the same time, they are doing and getting exposed to, through online platforms, maybe some, uh, I don't know, so be younger, but different artists, artists that they didn't know because it's so easy. Now you can, you know, normally you have to walk to the fair and it's 200 galleries and it takes you days on end to get through. But now you can do that all on your computer. If you really, really are um, anxious to see everything, you you can get through quite a lot um, to these online viewing rooms quite quickly. So I do think there are, or have heard stories about collectors who found it to be in some ways quite, um, yeah, quite beneficial. But that, that's different than necessarily exhibitions, but that's just more for the sort of uh, market side. I think what you said is, is very true from my own experience. Um, and I like to say often, if I buy something online um, and I receive it at home, I always say it's better than the picture. And it's because I know the artist, right? I know the artist, their practices, yeah. So um, I think I can, you know, attest to what you're saying. Um, Daisy, do you have any anything related to? I think it's challenging uh, for uh, collecting institutions because usually, you know, trained as a curator, you don't buy things you have not seen in person. I'm not talking right? about right. myself, yes, yes. of course. <laughs> Let me be clear. Oh, not well, talking about impulse. I'm talking about people I know who buy right, art. Right. But, 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 but also, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, I think museums for the kind of procedure, you know, usually you just have to either get works here, you go inspect the work, you have conservators looking at the physical conditions and to see whether there's any additional costs, et cetera. So I think that it has been challenging for, for museums um, as a collecting institution um, to acquire works um, and also you know, travel. You have travel restrictions. How can you go somewhere very easily without being quarantined? I've only got a few minutes left and I, we, do, we had so many questions come in and still have them coming in, um, but you kind of bring up one point with, um, uh, from one of our viewers. Um, with borders becoming so much less porous, what strategies are being considered for exhibitions with in international partners? Is that something that you've had to contend with? Have you had any experience dealing with that? Well, fortunately for us, um, we decided to you know, really focus on Hong Kong artists, um, you know, our local artists. And, um, and so I think my understanding Museum of Art has a, a major show with the, an Italian institution with Uzi uh, later on this year. Um, so I think some of may be affected in terms of, you know, uh, logistics and so on and so forth. But for us, the strategy uh, of focusing on the local, part of it is costs. Uh, and part of it is the artist is here. We can do, you know, work with them quite uh, easily. Um, so I think uh, it is something that, that all the institutions have to look at. Uh, in part of it is financial. You know, if you're not going to um, have the kind of resources, uh, many of uh, the museums are cutting back on, you know, instead of three shows, you know, making it two or one, uh, one you know, making it deep rather than, uh, you know, uh, quality rather than quantity. So I really do... The, the, the border issue it is still going to be um, uh, an issue, I think. But I, I think I do feel like there is going to be pockets. I think the people in maybe in Asia, we can travel. Um, uh, maybe the, they talk about the travel bubbles. Um, but I think going back to the virtual um, question, I think institutions really do have to think about, uh, and they are, um, like you mentioned the Met virtual uh, online exhibitions, which all the institutions have to do uh, to think, consider. And, uh, but I think the border issue, it, it is, um, it, and also this COVID is not going away in the next six months. I and mean, we, we're gonna be living with it for a year or so, another two years. So I think we, we just have to adapt, which I think institutions and collectors and museum goers, we all adapt. I sense Pauline wants to can chime in here. <laughs> I was just thinking, could I share this story? I mean, it's not a story, it's just what we're going through right now at M Plus, which is we have an exhibition opening 
we're installing it right now. Um, it is uh, a work by um, a solo exhibition of uh, Shirley Tse, who's the artist that was um, in the Venice Biennial in the Hong Kong Pavilion at the Venice Biennial. So this exhibition always travels back to Hong Kong. And we, um, as the uh, organizing um, co-organizer with ADC for this, um, it's traveling to the pavilion. But that is a site-specific work. The artist made it so that it is assembled and put together on site in relationship to the space. And she lives in LA, so she cannot come to Hong Kong. The curator of the exhibition lives in Amsterdam. She cannot come to Hong Kong. Um, I mean, they're both Hong Kong ID card holders, but they'd have to go through a quarantine, you know, and 14 days just doesn't really seem suitable for doing that. Plus they probably maybe quarantine when they go back home and, and all that. So how do you set up a solo exhibition <laughs> that's completely site specific and site oriented and, and all this? Um, so they're installing it right now in the pavilion. They're using cameras. Uh, live feeds, uh, uh, like three time zones. You know, you have LA and Europe and, and Hong Kong. And so this window of time in which you can get the artists to be present and the cure and the, our installers and our team and have everyone there and move things around. And, um, you know, it's, it's at adapting. This is what we had to come up with this plan. I mean, um, very sort of, uh, you know, organic because the situation was changing constantly, never knowing whether or not and at some point just say, okay, the artist is not going to be able to come. The curator is not going to be able to come. We have to find another solution. And this is what we'll do. And, um, and you know, it'll be ready and the show will be open on July 1st. But it, it is a first <laughs> for us. But it's, it's also a sign of in the future how we will have to think about setting up exhibitions where the artists may not always be able to be present. I mean, if you, in future we're expecting loans and loan exhibitions to be impacted because loans usually often require couriers to travel with artworks. So that will also surely impact future exhibitions in which we would borrow works from, from museums. And you know, it's, all, it's all measure of um, impacts down the line that nobody quite knows yet <laughs> how it all plan out, but uh, you know, very willing, I think, to adapt and and think together and work together to be, yeah, coming up with a solution that will be suitable, sort of, and workable for everybody. Great. Um, any last comment on that? I see you taking notes, Daisy, so you must have something to say. <laughs> any last thoughts? You, you talked about the increase of uh, online traffic for some of the museums, like the Met. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it's something that we have to consider even you know, even there are so many people can actually visit the map, let's say in a year or two years, not, not everybody around the world can visit the map physically. Um, and, and also I know that that museum has done tremendous work. Um, but also I think it, it is a really good time for museum leadership to consider more seriously about what that IT department, what their web and social media department should do when, should they do more? Because um, in my past experience, um, you know, my museum colleagues always complain. Like, they say, oh, we got two people working in the IT department. You know, we, got, we have to take care of the whole online presence. And it's really tough because now it really gives them some voice and some power to, to get more resources because apparently, you know, they are, they are basically representing the whole museum during the shutdown period. Um, I think that even for the Palace Museum in Beijing, I mean, during the shutdown period, that the information department play a major, major role and they, they have done tremendous work. So I want to just give a big applause to my colleagues in Beijing. Well, with that, um, you know, and our time is up, um, I am not as gloom and doom as I was before I came into this conversation. And um, it seems like there are just a lot of positive things going on. And from my experience, um, I've been through different crises yeah, as a startup entrepreneur. And every time I saw one of those crises, there was something good that came out of it. And so and I, it sounds that way from the artist perspective, from the museum uh, curator, director perspective. It sounds like there's just a lot of positive. It sounds like Hong Kong is doing a great job, not only controlling the virus, but also dealing with artists in the current situation. So I'm really happy to hear that perspective from all of you. And I wanted to thank each and every one of you for coming and joining us today. Um, the other thing I want to do is just put in a plug for, we have an upcoming exhibition. Um, it's of Hong Kong artists called Hong Kong Impressions. Uh, we'll be launching it in uh, the middle of August with, uh, in collaboration with um, Chinese University of Hong Kong. So I wanted to mention that. And for anybody that wants to know more about what's going on at the University of Chicago Ewan campus, you can visit our um, website, 
at www.uchicago.hk or check us out on our Facebook page. Some of you may be there now. Um, we have all of our information about upcoming events on either the website or the Facebook page. So thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon, all of you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.